Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week. It's Monday, the 18th of January, 2021. My name is Pastor Clint Lang. This is Food for Thought. Um, glad that you could join me this morning. We're going to be continuing our adventure in uh, reflecting on the book of James. And um, this morning, my focus is going to be on James chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. And James writes, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and are enticed. Then after that desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So in line with what we were talking about last week, um, James continues speaking about trials. And he made it very clear that trials build perseverance in us and help us take on the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we shouldn't be surprised at all that God allows us a diversity of trials because knowing that good things build character Um, God is going to allow us to face diversity of trials. And we should rejoice in this. Now, he adds a further dimension here in this book to the benefits package that uh, God gives the believer who endures and perseveres under trial. James states that the saints of God who persevere receive eternal reward from him. Now, he calls this reward the crown of life. Uh, The reward is referenced in one other place in Scripture when Jesus is speaking to the church in Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2. Um, We see in verse 10, uh, Jesus said, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I, I tell you, the devil will put some of you to prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. So, the crown of life, in this passage, Jesus clarifies, is eternal life. The victor's crown. Um, It's referenced as a crown as if the one who is taking on the eternal life that is given is actually uh, given a coronation when they meet the Lord. Um, referencing that we're sons and daughters of God. We're royalty in God's family because he's called us out of darkness into, out of darkness into his glorious light. It's to say that testing, even severe testing to the point of death, is only temporary, but upon this coronation that the believer will receive, we will reign with the Lord forever in his kingdom that will never end. And this is something really to look forward to. It's good news. And it's apparent that in the case of uh, a people, like we've seen in the past, like Job, uh, God sometimes permits us to face intense suffering from the enemy. But uh, death is swallowed up in victory. And as in the case of the church in Smyrna, James encourages the believers to trust in the promises of God when they're going through those difficulties, because God has promised all who are his children uh, will receive eternal life at the end of it all. The race is finished. The prize is the victor's crown, the crown of life. Now there's a shift from this point into what James wants to emphasize. Um, Not all trials are equal. Uh, Some trials are permitted by God as you know, like the persecution of the saints in Smyrna and Job, but they do not have their source in him. But some trials and tests actually have their source in God. Um, Exemplified, uh, we see the children of Israel as they are wandering through the desert. Um, God allowed the children of Israel to be tested. He put them to the test, actually. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 says, Remember how the Lord your God led you into, all the way into the wilderness these 40 years to humble and to test you 
in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. So trials and tests may come in different forms, and they might, may come from different sources, including God. But James wants to make a very clear distinction that not all trials are alike. Some trials come to the believer in the form of temptations. But temptations never come from God because God does not tempt his children with evil. James knew that most people have a, an evil tendency to blame God when they find themselves being tempted, but by his very nature, God is unable to either be tempted nor can he tempt anyone. It's not in him. Uh, only light, no darkness, no shadow of turning with him. The, the source of temptation may come from man's fallen nature and his fleshly desires, or it may come from the devil or his demons, but it never can come from the Lord. Um, sometimes we've heard theology that suggests that God, because he's sovereign over all things, has programmed everything. Therefore, God is actually the author of evil. But I don't believe this is correct. If you look at the rest of Scripture... God is not um, the author of evil. Satan is the father of all lies. God permits evil to exist and uses that as a catalyst to serve his purposes, but he did not create evil. There is an aspect of free will that God permits people and angelic beings to, uh, to make choices of their own. Now, Satan, being that father of lies, convinced people to choose um, sin and rebellion is sin, to choose to rebel against God's decrees and God's um, instructions. And man was made in the image of God, but Satan tempted mankind to fall and mankind fell. And once that happened, there truly was a paradigm shift in uh, humanity. Um, now, all of a sudden, man had a sin nature that came upon them. So now, from the, the time of Adam, every human being that's been born, except for Christ, because his mother was the Virgin Mary and his father was God, has inherited this sin nature which was passed from Adam all the way through the generations. So this sin nature is latent within each person. And even though we surrender, as Christians, we surrender our lives to Christ, we still wrestle with this sin nature that wants to try and vie for dominance. And we have to yield to the Holy Spirit in order that we do not fulfill the desires of the sin nature, which is in tandem inside of us at the same time. So if we look at Christ, we will not fulfill the desires of the sin nature, God gives us strength and power to overcome. Now James expands his thoughts expressing that people are tempted when their fallen natures rise within them and evil desires tell them what uh, to do and, and how to satiate a rebellious um, idea that goes against the word of God. Now, temptation is temptation because it's tempting to do. It's like the devil holds out an apple, a shiny red apple, or our own sin nature because of our desire for gaining wisdom, right? We look at this beautiful, shiny red apple, and boy, the more we look at it, the more tasty it looks, and the more we think, oh, that's going to be satisfying if we take a bite. But the, the apple of sin is, is filled with deadly poison and it's, it's rotten to the core. It may look shiny on the outside, but it is definitely uh, corrupted on the inside. So it's important for us when we are tempted, when that shiny apple passes by our vision, that we don't dwell on it, that we don't um, look at it and stare at it and ponder it. You see, it's important not to give that sin nature a foothold. Um, God calls us to turn our minds away from evil things. 
Now, there is no arguing with our sin nature or Satan. Our defense must always be to turn to the Word of God and the promises of the Word of God. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, what did he do? He always came back with the temptation. He came at the temptation with Scripture. Um, we have a choice, my friends. We do not have to obey the sin nature when it speaks, when that shiny apple passes before us. We don't have to take a bite. We don't have to dwell on it. We don't have to look at it. Finally, brothers and sisters, it says in Philippians 4.8, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, praiseworthy, think about such things. This is a choice. We have a choice to turn our minds away from evil things, to lay aside anything that is rebellious against God, to turn to His Word, to turn to Him, and, and look to Him for our sustenance and strength. My relationship with God is my number one focus. And I know that if I take care of that, God will take care of everything else. When, when you fix your eyes upon God, think about this. When you fix your eyes upon God, God fixes your thoughts. And King David says in Psalm 91, 14 and 15, Because he has focused his love on me, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls out to me, I will answer him, and I will be with him in his distress. I will deliver him, and I will honor him. See, David speaks through the mouth of God. This is a promise, a prophetic promise in the Word of God, and it is true. When we focus on the Lord, he gives us the strength to rise above all temptation and gives us all the strength to overcome our sin laden desires in our flesh and to live in a way that pleases God. You see, sin gives birth to death, but Jesus gives us life through the Spirit. This is food for thought.